Welcome to Season 5 of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former health commissioner here in Baltimore, Maryland. Our goal with this podcast is to bring scientific evidence and experience to shed light on critical health issues. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health On Call. Today, the podcast turns to the mental health of children and adolescents. Dr. Josh Sharfstein speaks with Johns Hopkins professor Tamar Mendelson, a psychologist and researcher who is closely watching the growing mental health crisis in the United States. Let's listen. Dr. Tamar Mendelson, thank you so much for joining us on Public Health On Call to talk about what many have called a crisis in mental health for America's young people. Can you talk about why there is such a recognition of this state of crisis? Thank you, Josh, for having me on. And absolutely, this is a time of serious crisis in terms of youth mental health. Um, The American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and the Children's Hospital Association, in fact, declared a national emergency in child and adolescent mental health during the pandemic. And the U.S. Surgeon General also issued an advisory on the youth mental health crisis. So what we know is that young people's mental health was already a concern before the pandemic, but it's now, I think, really become something that the public is more aware of because the pandemic really intensified and increased these problems. What we saw is that rates of childhood mental health concerns, including suicidal behavior, were already increasing between 2010 and 2020. In 2019, for example, one in three high school students and about half of female students were reporting feelings of sadness and hopelessness that were persistent. Um, And that was an increase of about 40 percent from 2009. Um, But really, the pandemic intensified all of this. So what we've seen are real increases in emergency department visits across the country. This includes for suspected suicide attempts. What? about the pandemic was particularly, or is still particularly difficult for children and adolescents? Well, for one thing, we know that over 140,000 children in the United States have lost a primary or a secondary caregiver. And youth of color have been hit particularly hard in terms of these types of losses. So clearly losing caring adult who's important in your life is going to be extremely traumatic. In addition, many young people have had to cope with increases in problems like food insecurity or parents losing jobs and having a lot more financial pressures. Again, these impacts are particularly hitting youth growing up in communities of concentrated disadvantage and poverty, um, as well as Black, Black Latino, um, and, and Indigenous young people. And the loss of school, how did that factor in? Absolutely. So I think, you know, across the board, young people have you know, had their lives disrupted in really pervasive ways. So school, going to school, that's a really basic thing that young people do. And all of a sudden they were stuck at home. They were doing school over the internet um, or perhaps not at all. And so there were, there were a lot of disruptions in terms of routines and in terms of abilities and capacities to have social connections. And adolescents, like that's what they're all about. Like they are growing in terms of their social emotional connections. They're figuring out who they are by interacting with others and forming deeper relationships. So I think all of that was really tough on adolescents. So a lot of times people think of mental health challenges, you know, affecting one person at a time. And so we can think about children, adolescents, young people in our lives we know have had a tough time during the pandemic. But what we're talking about now is something that's affected millions of children, millions of adolescents and young people. And so the solutions are a little more complicated than just here's who you can call or 
here's what you can do for your one child. How do we start to think about what's necessary? And maybe before we get into the full solutions, like what is our system like to respond to this scale of a problem? Well, we really lack the infrastructure and the service delivery systems that are needed in this moment. Again, even before the pandemic, young people who needed mental health services often did not receive them. So over half of young people needing mental health services were not getting them. And there are a number of reasons for that, including, you know, financial barriers, stigma, lack of culturally appropriate treatments, including, you know, Baltimore has a growing Latino population and we have a shortage of Spanish speaking providers. So there are a lot of reasons for that. During the pandemic, the needs skyrocketed. And at the same time, there was even less availability, right, in terms of providers. And so I do think that the use of telehealth got increased recognition as one avenue that we should really think about for trying to increase access to services. I think it speaks also to the need for, you know, using public health strategies to try, as you're saying, to reach people sort of on that population level. School-based mental health is an important way of reaching young people, How can we really integrate mental health supports sustainably and comprehensively in schools? How can we also, you know, really provide funding for mental health promotion programs across the life course and preventing mental health problems before they get to the point of being diagnosable clinical disorders? So as you think about the challenges facing the population, you have the care issues and access to care, which is you're saying we're poor before the pandemic and really need attention. But you're also thinking at the population level, what can be done to improve well-being, support young people before they get to a level of clinical need? Absolutely. I think more and more we need to recognize that waiting until the need for treatment is is waiting too long. And our insurance, our reimbursement models are very much linked with treatment and diagnoses, but I think we have learned so much in the prevention science field about the ways that we can effectively prevent the onset of mental health problems or at least delay that. So we really need to think about models for reimbursement of those prevention services. And there is some real potential cost savings benefits in the long term if we can figure this out. So Let's imagine you had a magic wand, you had the funding. What kinds of programs would you like to see broadly available to children, adolescents, young people in this country? Could you give a couple examples? Absolutely. So my area of research really focuses a lot on schools, and I would love to see K through 12 programming that supports young people's social emotional development and their positive mental health development. I do research in particular on mindfulness-based programs, and there is a growing body of evidence showing ways that these kinds of programs, which can be delivered universally to all students, that they are very helpful for providing ways for young people to recognize and manage their own emotions in really productive ways. So those those types of strategies can be integrated in schools. We also have social emotional learning programs with years of rigorous evidence behind them that can be implemented. And I think, you know, a key challenge here is the implementing side. So we've tested a lot of these these programs, but actually getting them into real world settings in a sustainable way has been the main challenge. And often they sit on the shelf. You know, there's a often a 14 year gap between testing a program and then actually getting it into the real world. So I think that's where we really need to focus is how can we help support schools to be able to create the infrastructure for delivering those programs in a coherent way across the K through 12 spectrum rather than in a piecemeal way or or not at all. Interesting. If, if anything can shake the system a little bit to change, perhaps the pandemic can. And I wonder whether there is anything from the pandemic experience, the telehealth or you know any of the other things we've learned about young people and mental health that 
you'd like to be part of a new normal with a bigger focus on prevention? Absolutely. I mean, I, I do think that um, while prevention is very important, we need treatment as well. We have effective treatments for most common mental disorders. Having clinicians, mental health professionals on site at schools is incredibly important. I think the use of telemedicine is also extremely helpful and can broaden the reach. And I think the more that we have mental health promotion and prevention programs as well, we can actually reduce the number of young people needing more intensive one-on-one services and then hopefully be able to provide those services more effectively. Increased awareness about mental health is also very important. And maybe one silver lining of the pandemic is that people really are talking about it more now. And I hope that this um, means there will be increased awareness among parents and administrators about the importance of really destigmatizing and addressing these issues. Maybe for my last question, and I know you are a psychologist by training, is that right? That is right. I wonder for listeners who may um, have children who they're worried about, or they know children in their family that they're worried about, what should they do if, for example, a young person is um, not their, not themselves, you know, appears quite sad, drawn. What, 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 what should someone do? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the first thing is to have open and frequent communication with your child, so that first, so that you do notice if there are changes in their behavior, and also so that you can talk to them about it, ask them about it, and you know, ultimately, I think linking your child with a specialist who can do more of an assessment and help figure out what might be going on is really important. Again, schools can be a point of contact. So if your school does have a counselor, a social worker, a psychologist, they may be able to start that process and and then link to somebody else for a referral. Um, But there are also many resources that you can find online if you're interested in finding a professional. But I think really key is is talking to your child, knowing your child, knowing what is and isn't typical for them and changes in behavior that, that look like withdrawal are really important to follow up on. The other thing I would say too, though, is that kids are very resilient. And even though a lot of kids have had disruptions to their routines, I think most will be able to bounce back. Some have even experienced positive impacts of the pandemic. So I think, you know, knowing your child and what's working and not working for them is always super important. Well, Dr. Mendelson, thank you so much for your advice there. And thanks for all of your work and for joining me on Public Health On Call. Thank you. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker, Matthew Martin, Spencer Greer, and Holly Cardinal, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media support from Grace Holes Fernandez. Thank you for listening.